<laughs> well, what I was going to say is that, um, well, I'm going to say something first. Why is it me and who is just, you know, I'm just an amateur <laughs> as far as uh, the Jesus prayer and not a professional like uh, nuns and uh, monks are. And the reason is that precisely because uh, of this in complete involvement of life into a life of prayer, people are usually reluctant to simply share about it. Um, I told Michelle a story the other day. <laughs> it's about a movie that maybe some of you have seen. It is called Ostrov, which means on, in Russian, the island. And it's the story of a little island where there is a monastery. And, um, it's contemporary, 20th century, 21st century. Do what you need to show us. Hello. Do you want to? Do you want to be Mother Victoria? Or do you want a new, different name? That's okay. Okay, uh, I muted them. I'm sorry, but go ahead, Father. Father, do it, and then I'll unmute them. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, I'm sure we will have time for questions and discussion at the end. Okay. Uh, so in this little island, there is a monastery, and in this monastery, there is a strange character who looks more like a homeless person, but who has this incredible gift of welcoming people. Oh, no, not of welcoming people. I am totally wrong there. I was thinking about someone else that we talked about, Seraphim of Sarov. But who looks like a, you know, a totally uninteresting person, um, but who has this incredible gift of giving advice to people when they need it, all sorts of advice for all aspects of life. And there is a woman, I believe, who comes to receive a word of wisdom from him. And when she asks him, uh, she asks him, where is father, his name is Anatoly, where is father Anatoly? Immediately, instead of saying, it's me, what do you want? He says, oh, don't go and see him. He is a fake. He is a joke. You're wasting your time and so on. But of course, he's a good man. So after she really, really insists and shows she's desperate, he says, OK, I'm going to lead you to, lead you to his cell. And maybe he will accept to, through me to tell you a few words. And that's how she gets the advice with Father Anatoly pretending to be a person that he's not and telling, please don't take anybody seriously, especially me. So that would explain why it is me that you have tonight, <laughs> because the real professionals, like the sisters of the monastery, for instance, where they share this attitude that you are always welcome, I'm sure, I know everybody's always welcome there, but if you want to hear a word of wisdom, you really have to ask for it which means you really, really, really want it. It's not tourism, it's personal quest, I would say. So what else to say about the monastery, now that I know that some of the sisters are online, uh, <laughs> besides it's beautiful and welcoming, and you have the, the, all the richness of this tradition that goes back for some part of it to the second and third century, uh, it's simply a place where you want to find peace, you want to find love in God, you want to find a nonviolent God, go for it. All right, perfect. Okay, um, before we get started, um, uh, sisters from the monastery, we'd like to welcome you um, here to us. Um, we know your humbleness is probably why you're not showing your, your faces. <laughs> Um, but thank you uh, for sharing tonight with us. And uh, Father Jude, we appreciate you being here also. Oh. And come and sit. And then, um, okay, so uh, just a little introduction. Tonight is our um, a public lecture on the Philokalia, which by the way, can be spelled with a K or a C. And, uh, and the practice of the Jesus prayer. So uh, Father Jude is here. If you would say your whole name uh, for us, that would be great. And then give us a little introduction and then you can take it away. Sure. 
All right. Uh, let me first see if I can bring this. Yes. Okay. Now I see my picture, but I don't see anybody. Okay, Father Jude, it's all yours. All right. Well, first, thank you for inviting me tonight. Um, you wanted to have my full name for starters. So I am Jacques Jude Lepine. And uh, yes, you can detect uh, French accent. I'm originally from France, from Paris. Um, I, this, I studied in different countries, um, theology, anthropology, literature. And uh, I discovered Eastern Christianity relatively early in my life when I was 18. And in the very same moment, I discovered Christian, Eastern Christianity. I discovered um, basically my faith in God, in a nonviolent God. And I discovered that uh, being a Christian is not being alone, is to be in communion with others, not only other Christians, but everyone. And that's what I've been very modestly and probably very unsuccessfully to live by for all these years with uh, my wife, Brigitte, who is probably watching us now in different countries, um, Middle East, France, Belgium, and different states where I finished my studies. Uh, I should have, I should uh, conclude by saying that uh, um, my interest in linking nonviolence and Christianity has been uh, very much um, determined by my meeting uh, with uh, René Girard and all his work. Uh, I just recommend one book called Things Hidden Since the Foundation of the World. Uh, I don't tell more about it. Uh, it's a very intriguing title. It's not ambiguous though, it's not mysterious because in fact, it is a quote from Jesus uh, at the beginning of one of the gospels who says in the uh, synagogue, I will open my mouth and say things hidden since the foundation of the world. Um, and I guess that's enough for an introduction about me. Um, now I would like to start with Philokalia. So you can see the first slide with the strange name and, and characters in Greek, Philokalia. And I'm gonna try to impress you by continuing to read in Greek the next few lines, <laughs> although my Greek is extremely limited, but it's important to have the full title. Philokalia ton deron niptikon, which translates roughly by the love of beauty or goodness, which is the meaning of Philokalia, by the ancients, Tonderon, Niptikon. And Niptikon means people who are awake. Awake as opposed uh, to being sleepwalking in life. Uh, so the Philokalia is a series of books, five volumes, which is about being awakened to the richest, the most profound part of life. And how do they do that? These five volumes only talk about one topic essentially, which is a little prayer. Oh, how do I? Okay. It's a little prayer called the Jesus prayer that the people you see now on your screen, the three icons have been practicing themselves. Uh, ever since the fourth century. And before I talk about the prayer, I would like to talk a little bit how they developed it, the historical context. So let's travel back to time a little bit and go back to the fourth century, uh, where after three centuries of pretty uh, uh, hard persecutions, through the edict of the Emperor Constantine, don't ask me the year, I'm very bad at that. But the Byzantine Empire, of the, the Roman Empire of the time, Constantine, cons, uh, converted to Christianity. And as a result, all of a sudden, Christians were not persecuted anymore. They were not being afraid of being Christians. At the very opposite, all of a sudden, it was comfortable, it was honorable, and in fact, it was necessary to be a good member of society, to be a Christian. So 
change 180 degrees of the situation of the church in the state. And uh, that was great because it, it started centuries and centuries of transformation of society, some very good ones, uh, many very good ones, and also um, a, a blossoming of uh, monasteries, of, of, of basically all forms of Christian life, of architecture, of rituals, and even things that we never remember that today, but some caritative institution that we call you know, humanitarian today, like hospitals where they were invented by one of the fathers of the church. Uh, the very first hospital was invented by St. Basil uh, of Caesarea in the fourth century, for instance. Uh, a tradition which has been continued in the Western countries by the monks and nuns in the Middle Ages. Um, but uh, back to our uh, fourth century, some people thought that, well, now that it's comfortable and honorable to be a Christian, maybe, maybe that's not the best way to preserve, you know, all the zeal and the impetuosity and the radicalism of the gospel. Uh, one example that which for me is very important is that, for instance, the first centuries, martyrs, sometimes were martyrs because they refused to be to serve in the military so in the in the army uh, now the army was wearing the cross on its uh, uniforms and uh, the non-violent aspect of christianity the love of the enemies was lost so some people said okay we have not to simply correct that we have to correct ourselves and get out of society out of the city of the police, basically out of civilization, and live a radical form of um, gospel. I put here a few names, a few icons of them. The one which is the most famous is certainly Saint Anthony, who is also called the father of the monks. And uh, the next one is um, Mary of Egypt, who was first a prostitute, and then became one of the most incredible hermits uh, in the area of the J Jordan uh, West Bank, East Bank, actually. And the last one is Saint. Uh, now it's hidden by my screen. Oh, sorry. There you go. Saint Macarius, who was also from Egypt. So plenty of those people, mostly men, but also a few women, like Saint Mary went to live into the desert. They were basically surviving out of foraging, a little bit of gardening, and they were making a little bit of money necessary to buy the very basic things through selling uh, baskets that they were weaving. Uh, where were they? Mostly in Egypt, uh, in also in an area which would be Syria nowadays, and uh, in the most, and also in the area which would be Lebanon today. Later on, of course, it will be Greece, Montatos, and then all the parts of Russia where you still had those big monasteries. But this is where monasticism started. And this is where the first people began to practice the Jesus prayer. So very radical people. And their ambition was to pray all the time. And this is why I mentioned they were just to support themselves. They were just doing weaving baskets or gardening because they could have their hands occupied with an, uh, something, whereas their mind and their heart could be just occupied with prayer. Second part of the historical context, which is important to know, is that although these people, they were living alone, sometimes little colonies of dozens of them living together, they were not cut from the big tradition of the, lit of the prayer of the church, the Byzantine liturgy. It's extremely rich. Um, there are a number of cycles of prayer going on at the same time, interpenetrating each other throughout the liturgical year. There is a daily cycle that starts with the night, because in the Bible, the day starts, there, is a, there was an evening, there was a morning. So the first uh, service starts at night, Vespers. 
and then the middle of the night, and then when the sun rise, and then middle of the morning, middle of the day, middle of the afternoon, and back again. Then there is a weekly cycle that starts with the Sunday, of course, and every day of the week has a, has a set of prayers which corresponds to the people or the events, which have been uh, the events of, uh, of salvation, which have been commemorated on that specific day. For instance, Friday is the cross um, and, uh, uh, and also the mother of God, Mary. Uh, Monday is St. John the Baptist and so on. And then there are two yearly cycles of feasts, a series of feasts which are, um, which depends on the day of Easter, which is the feast of the feast, the feast of the resurrection, a series of feasts which are depending again on how many days before or after Easter, and another cycle of feasts that always falls on the same date every year. So just, I was mentioning this just to uh, focus on one fact is that do not imagine those hermits people, they were hermits, to live completely on their own, separated from society. They were, but through their prayer, they were still united with the city and with the other Christians of the city and through their prayer with everybody in fact. Some prayers insist. We love, we pray for, and for instance, at night, we, one of the last prayer of the days is for our, those who love us and for those who hate us, for instance. So just to, to make you realize the connection between those individuals and the whole tra Byzantine Christian tradition. Hence those two pictures when you see monks who are all together uh, reuni uh, uniting for a vigil for an evening of prayer and on the left, on the right side, divine liturgy. Okay, now let's go to the Philokalia itself. So the prayer they were saying, they began to develop. Before I even talk about the prayer, let's say where we find information about it. Uh, well, they never planned to work, to, to write on it, but they were people who were talking. And first of all, talking to each other, there was a verbal and oral tradition. And if you are interested, you can find a little book, very thin, called The Sayings of the Desert Fathers. It was written before the Philokalia. It was oral traditions put together. And they are not like doctrinal information. They are very little, sometimes anecdotal story. Like, for instance, there is one about um, there's one about reconciliation, and it goes like this. Once upon a time, <laughs> there were two, uh, two monks living together in the desert. And reading the Bible, they say, you see, people are fighting all the time. We never fought, so we never reconciled. So we're probably bad Christians. <laughs> so we have to do something. Let's fight so we can reconcile. And the, and the other monk says, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's do that. So one of the monks says, I'm going to take this stone and I'm going to say it's mine. OK. So the monk takes the stone and says, it's mine. And the other, the other monk goes, yeah, keep it. It's yours. So that's the type of wisdom you find in the sayings of the Desert Fathers. Now, after that, we have ontologies, so uh, basically uh, uh, sums of books or small bootlets, um, which tell about how to practice this famous Jesus prayer that these people from the Desert Father were start and, and after that were, um, were using to pray. So the two most famous ones are uh, the Philokalia of the Naked Fathers, that's the one I presented in the first slide, which is basically written in Greek and coming from libraries of the Montatos. Montatos is this island in Greece, or almost an island, where only monks uh, are allowed to live. It's a, an independent republic, but it's part of Greece. And uh, besides this one, 
where you can find a text all the way back from the fourth century uh, to the 18th century. There is a translation in Slavonic, which means ancient um, Russian. It's called the Bro Dobroto Ljubli. And these are the two most complete ones. For those of us, people of the 21st century, well, I have to tell you one thing about those two books first, that has to be said, it is very often very repetitive. <laughs> so there is a way, there is a short way. Why is this repetitive? It's because prayer is not like science. You know, we can accumulate, we make one discovery and then a sudden discovery and we add information, data and science on top of each other. And that's how science progress. With prayer, it's different. Everybody has to start from ground zero. So what we find in, um, in the Philokalia is the testimony of these people who had to go through a whole inner itinerary of transformation under different viewed from different angels using different terms, using even different cultures. But the experience is always the same to some at different degrees, different accents, and so on. But so that's why somehow the philokalia is a bit repetitive. But there are enough topics to not be bored, of course. But if you want to have the short version, I recommend um, this anthology of the Philokaya, which is itself an anthology, which is called The Art of Prayer by Itumen Cariton of Valam. Valam is one of those huge monasteries at the border between Finland and uh, Russia, which were almost destroyed during the Bolshevik Revolution and then were uh, restored. And if you want, if you are not the type to read theory, but who like to read novels, then I recommend The Way of the Pilgrim, which is an anonymous little book about a pilgrim who discovered the Jesus prayer and who began to practice it, basically walking from place to place throughout Russia, Ukraine, Siberia, and providentially he was meeting people who would help him to go further to achieve what is to be achieved with the Jesus prayer, which is constant, permanent, continual prayer. One last suggestion as fast as readings is another book called Siluan the Atonit, so which means Siluan from the Mount Athos, another strange name. It means the man from the forest, like Silvius uh, in, in Roman, in Latin. And it's beautiful writing of um, simple, beautiful writing of a monk from the Montatos of the middle 20th century, uh, who used to be quite a character, obviously, but who had an intense experience of transformation using the Jesus prayer. And who put it in sometimes poetic words, but most of the time, very, very strong, short statements. At the end of this presentation, I will read you a few of them. Actually, I think I can't resist to tell you the first one, um, one of them, where he says, the one who hasn't loved his enemies has not discovered the sweetness of the Holy Spirit. Very strong, very short. Now, the Jesus prayer itself. What are the words? It's a short prayer. Here they are, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's not here on the board that you see, but in fact, we're going to see all sorts of versions of it. But before I go to the different versions, uh, notice that it is usually practiced with a little rosary, which is called the Chotki in Russian. And it has usually 33 of 50 or 100 beads. Why 33 beads? It's the age of Jesus when he was crucified and raised from the dead. And why those words? If you use the, uh, the Greek, if you use this word in Greek and build an acronym with it, 
Well, you have those words, Jesus Christos Feu Iu Soter, which means using the first word of each of the, the first letter of these words, you have the word fish in Greek, ictus. Maybe you've seen people with bumper stickers with a little fish. That's where it's coming from. And it's the acronym for Jesus Christ, Son of God, save. Soter, save us. So this is, in fact, what all the Jesus prayer is as far as the form. But, and this is something which is to be known, especially uh, for those of you, if one day you visit the monastery, everything in the Orthodox Church is very individualized, very personalized to the person. The rule always chants less than the person. So even the words of the Jesus prayer, they're not the same for everyone. I will tell you in a moment why, but here are some variations, for instance. Lord Jesus Christ, son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Or you can drop the end and just have Lord Jesus Christ, son of the living God, have mercy on us. Or you can just say, Kyrie son, Lord have mercy in Greek. Jesus have mercy or simply Jesus. And this is the role of the starets, of the spiritual counselor, spiritual father or mother, uh, who will help the beginner to find the words that really fit. You find the word through practice, through trial and error sometimes. Why? This, we're gonna see in a few slides, it's the technique, the way the words are being said. Um, some people even blend different languages. Another form is Yeshua, which means Jesus in Hebrew, Eleison, have mercy in Greek. And for those of us who like literature, there is a little book, probably the most famous by uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, which is called Matryonized Homestead. And Matryonized Homestead is the story of this poor old woman who has forgotten everything. Everything has been taken from her from the, uh, during the revolution. She's just surviving in a little cabin, in a little uh, cabin. Uh, all she remembers is that she has to be good with her neighbors. And one night her neighbors come to, to rob her and she remembers she has to help her neighbors. So she helps them to rob her. But I'm mentioning Matryonas because Matryonas has forgotten her prayers that she had learned when she was a little girl at church. So that all she remembers is God help, God help. And that's what she says. And again, this is just to mention that the Jesus prayer is an individual experience in the sense it is a personal experience. So it's not the same for everyone. Uh, in the way of the pilgrim, the pilgrim starts to achieve thousands of times a day and more and more and more. It changes along with his twist and with almost, I would say, his personality. And now the techniques. Why also do we need to have different words? Well, the prayer starts with saying the words with your mouth and your tongue. But when it really starts is when it becomes from saying into praying by concentrating, of course, our mind into the words and their meaning. Uh, their meaning is not like opening the definition in the book. Uh, the meaning of the words basically remember is informed by all the tradition of the rest of the liturgical prayer that people who do the Jesus prayer practice. And that's probably a difference with a mantra, uh, which can be practiced with or without connection to uh, the rest of the religion where it is coming from. The Jesus prayer assumes a text for granted that when you practice it, you're a Christian who goes to church. Not to mean that if you, you want to use it, it won't be good, it will be good, but the full benefit of it really comes to our connection with the rest of the spiritual and liturgical uh, and the uh, kindest loving tradition of the church. Um, 
So the first, the second step is to really think about the words and we can call it the prayer of the mind where we think. And then we add, we try to have the words sticking not only to our mind, but also to our breathing. Um, you know that in the Bible, the spirit and the spirit of God, the word for it, uh, hura in Hebrew means breathe, in fact. Um, but I want to say something here really important that I always mention to people interested in the Jesus prayer uh, is that um, today, we, people of the 21st century, we don't know how to breathe anymore. Maybe when we are among the privileged who live in Ohio and we have a healthy lifestyle, we have do sports, yoga, and so on, uh, we know how to open up our chest and to breathe. A lot of people, unfortunately, they don't, and they just cannot jump. And I really discourage that from their daily activity to prayer without of transition of learning to breathe calmly and deeply. And after you've done that for a few times, then you can try to have the words of the prayer sticking to the breathing. And this is where people are different and languages are different. Uh, for French, for instance, to say a literal translation of the Jesus prayer in a way that is sticking to your breathing, I don't know how people can do that. I know a few people, for me, it's totally impossible. I tried, I tried, or well, I got frustration, and I then finally find other ways. And then the third step, and this is called what we call the prayer of the heart, which is another name for the Jesus prayer, is instead of using the breathing, to try to pay attention to your heartbeat and use the heartbeat to be the beat of your prayer. It's very, very difficult. But at the same time, people who, who practice this, like our anonymous pilgrim in the way of the pilgrim, then they achieve a moment when even where they sleep, they are praying. I'm not there. Please don't ask me for advice there. <laughs> but it is feasible once the goal has been set, which is constant prayer. So here are ultimately um, the different steps as far as the technique, first with the mouth, but then with a silent mouth and migrating the prayer just into the mind by being mindful about each of its words. And then comes a moment which is not only a psychological transformation, but which is basically a gift of God. We can't decide, we can't achieve it. And those who achieve it, they always say the same thing. It was given. It's a charis, a grace, which is that even the words of the prayer somehow stop and inside there is only silence. It usually goes with stillness of the body and slow breathing. Now, this supposes a certain vision of men, a certain anthropology, um, which is a traditional one, plus something which is unique to this tradition. For, as you know, for uh, the Bible, man is composed of a body, a mind, and a soul. For the Jesus prayer, there is an additional component, which is both material and immaterial which is called the heart. I just refer to the heart as the final destination of the prayer. And very often, and when I was talking about repetition in the Philokaya, I was thinking about this first. The advice is to look for the descent of the mind into the heart. And what is the heart? The heart is both a physical place at the center 
of our chest. And somehow, I don't know how to put this, we need an image, like the visible plug for the invisible immaterial part of the most important element of our very unique being, the one which is different from everyone else. So we could, uh, we could call it the place of where my person is. But I am not just my person. This very deep down place is the place where my person is in communion with the spirit of God. Um, Saint August, uh, yes, Saint Augustine said once about God, you who are more intimate to me than myself. The heart is exactly this place. And it has to be achieved to, to be found. It takes a lot, a lot of time. But when we reach this moment and this place, then the whole being, body, mind, and soul, connected to the heart, is praying. Now, how do people actually pray? First, the eyes closed. First, uh, first uh, condition for concentration. They can be kneeling, they can be standing up, they can be, uh, can be sitting straight. They can try in order to physically have the mind descending into the heart to sit in some kind of almost fetal position. Uh, one constant advice is that whatever position, make sure it's not too comfortable. It doesn't have to be painful, but it is so easy to fall asleep. So look for a perfect position, which means a little bit imperfect as far as the comfort. Now, there is nothing wrong to say the, prayer, the Jesus prayer while being in motion, like walking or doing a repetitive task like the deserts, fathers of the deserts, we are weaving baskets, for instance, or to simply walk into nature and pay attention in nature to the sounds of nature, because we all have the same experience. When we pay attention to the singing of the birds, the winds through the leaves of the tree, um, what happens or our walls on the or steps on the stone, what happened is that somehow it is like listening to the silence behind those very simple sounds. And of course, if you are walking, I don't recommend to have the eyes closed. Um, what happens now when we pray? First thing we notice, unless we have received a very special moment of enthusiasm, which happens to a lot of people, is that it's difficult. The first difficulty is the difficulty for concentrating. Uh, because as soon as we try to concentrate on the Jesus prayer, on the words, we become aware of like a train going on in front of our mind, of thoughts, of feelings, of desires, of worries, of frustrations, or impatience. Impatience is a big one, you know. And the first step is, and I'm sure here all those of you who practice meditation, we recognize that, is to distinguish this kind of ebullition in our mind, which is absolutely constant, from the fact that we are able to observe it which is to say from the silent observer in our mind who takes notice of all these motions, impulses, desires, and so on that is happening. And also the first difficulty is that with discouragement or excitement is to practice as we should on a very set schedule, because our personal schedules, events, emotions, everything we have to do, all these will start what we call spiritual warfare. That is to say a fight to find the moment and the place 
to regularly set it aside and focus on the Jesus prayer. Just that difficulty of concentrating and difficulty of establishing a regular schedule are two huge obstacles that we have to overcome. And it's never, never completely achieved. But we have to know it has to be done. Now, what about the fight against all those emotions, passions, etc.? The technical terms in the, in the Philokalia is the fight against passions, which we could call in our words, uh, fight against desires, in fact. All desires, they are rooted in the fact that we want more for ourselves. It starts with the Bible, first chapters. What do they want to do? And and Eve, they want to take the place of God. You will be like gods, says the temptator. And in a way, everything, all our desires, we want to be gods. We want to be our own god and god for others. And here is a list of traditional, um, uh, of traditional passions that we don't find in our way. Anger, of course, which is, of course, a form of rivalry and violence with others. And most of our passions are triggered, even directly or indirectly, by our relationship with others. Sorrow which can be caused by envy, because I don't have what he has or she has. Gluttony, I take more than what I need. So if I take more, I take from others. Avarice, avarice, I'm not sure of the pronunciation here, which is all about power and superiority over others. Uh, vainglory, which means to be attached to symbols of prestige, again, to take over the first place. And there is one more passion, which is not in the West. This is a very traditional list that I just gave you, common to, to the East and the West. But there is one which is specific to Eastern Christianity, which is acidia, which is depression. And there is certainly a side of depression, which is pathological. But there is a side of depression, uh, which is induced also by your relationship to others. If I cannot be on top of the others, and I feel they are on top over me, then I am in depression. And this type of depression is a passion we have to fight. Here is a small um, prayer that summarizes the fight against passions. It's by St. Ephraim of, um, the, of Syria. Um, o Lord and Master, and this prayer is being said every day during the 40 days before Easter. O Lord and Master of my life, take from me the spirit of sloth, despondency, lust for power, and idle talk. But grant unto me, your servant, the spirit of, here it says chastity, I prefer the word sophrony that I will define later. The spirit of sophrony, humility, patience, and love. And yea, O Lord and King, grant me to see my own faults and not to judge my brothers and sisters. For blessed are thou. Blessed means I say a good word to you. For blessed are you and to edges of edges. Amen. Now, after the passions, I have to say a word about the virtues, the good side that we have to develop. Um, there are plenty of lists of those virtues. Humility, passions, gratitude, wisdom. And then sophrosyne, the one I was mentioning. Sophrosyne is difficult to translate into English and in French as well. It's, it's a Russian word. It combines integrity, honesty, independence from others' opinion, and absolutely standing for what you believe. And then the other one is also hard to translate in one word, umiliene, which is also a Russian word, which you could try to loosely translate by loving kindness, tender mercy. Now, these virtues, it's not a list of things we have, traits of character we have to achieve. They are more like the fruits, the result of prayer in our connection with others. And ultimately, 
is not being between you, humble or patient and so on, is to be more and more at the image and at the resemblance of Jesus and his mother and of all the saints. Because the Jesus prayer, remember, takes us gradually in connection inside our heart with the spirit of God. And we cannot meet God, know God, without becoming God. This is something very important in the Eastern tradition, deification, theosis in Greek. Um, one story I want to tell you about this is about a big, uh, a great uh, character in the story, in the history of Jesus' prayer, Saint Seraphim of Sarov. Saint Seraphim of Sarov was transfigured, was radiating light during his ad at a moment in his life. And there was a witness, uh, Molotidov, I believe was his name. And when he was transfigured, he asked Molotidov, what do you see? And Molotidov tell him, it's like there is snow all around us, but the snow is radiating light. And there is this perfume, which, is, which I've never uh, smelled before. And uh, Saint Seraphim told him, well, you see, and what else? And he said, I see you, Seraphim, Father Seraphim, your face is illuminated, is radiating light. And Seraphim answers to him, and I see you, my dear Molotov, you are also radiating the same light. There is a song that says, in your light, we shall see the light. Ultimately, the transformation of the individual that you and I are through the Jesus prayer, through spiritual life, is a transformation that brings us into God himself. It's, they call it very ambitiously, the uh, fathers of the church, deification, becoming God himself. Here is an example of Sophrosyne that I like. This is not a regular icon, it's a Catholic painting from a martyr of the 20th century in the extermination camp. A Catholic priest who gave his life when people were being selected to be shut into a room until they die from hunger and thirst, he offered to take the place of one of them who was begging for mercy because he had family. Uh, his name was Maximilian Kolb, and here is why I think he's a great example of Sophrosyne. Um, here is the, one of the quotes about that he said, one of his uh, common sayings, be a man, never be embarrassed about your convictions. And this is where it's touching. Humiliene, tender loving mercy. This is an icon of probably the most famous icon, the Virgin of Vladimir, of the Mother of God, of Mary. And just looking at the position of the two faces of Jesus and the Mother, and the absolutely unique look of Mary is with a blend of sadness and tenderness at the same time, and absolute trust and faith. Uh, is, I believe, a good example of what is humiliene. Basically, her tenderness is directed toward both Jesus and the one who is looking at the icon. It's a trick of the icons, uh, in the technique of the icon, that the icon of the mother of God, you will see that most of them, she looks, she is looking at the same time at the one who is watching the icon, and her son, because ultimately it's the same. So to conclude on passions and virtue, there is no spiritual life without fighting the passions and developing virtues. And the most famous book that develops that, in, which is part of the Philokalia, is called The Ladder of Divine Ascent by St. John Climatus. Climatus means a scale, or a step, uh, step tool in Greek. And there is this famous icon that represents the book where you see all these people trying to reach heaven, months, and the little demons who try to 
bring them back down. Uh, which means that uh, there is a message very important is that in spiritual life, there is not such a thing as sitting and waiting and pausing like you can pause your computer. It's either progress or redress. I'm pausing here because that's a tough one. Because we all want to take a break in our life. But as far as spiritual life, there is not such a thing as a break. Um, a break is always dangerous. Uh, and, but progression with ups and downs is totally, absolutely natural. Now, what happens when we pray, as far as the phenomenology of it, if you want, first recommendation which is given is that we should always deny any role to imagination apparitions, sensations, supernatural manifestations of feelings. Because what is, if such a thing is sent by God, then even if we deny it, it will find its way through our denial. But never pray for achieving some apparition or supernatural experience or a sensation or a feeling or a state. All those are not the goals of prayer, which is to get closer to God in the heart. There is one exception that the Philokalia developed, which is spiritual warmth. They say if we feel a certain warmth around the area of our heart during prayer, we should not fight it. But of course, it can become ambiguous and it can become something that we are looking for and then it's not to be welcomed. And also it becomes quite ambiguous if it goes down into your belly. And this is where the role of the starets, of the spiritual advisor, the elder, the spiritual father, spiritual mother, uh, to help us to discern how authentic is the experience and to go further on and to avoid uh, being trapped uh, into one of those uh, basically dangers. We can talk a little bit about the degrees of inner prayer is that for a long time and for probably most of us, prayer will be an activity rather than it will be for some exceptions saints certainly, it will be a state of silent and stillness. The moment where it has become as natural as our breathing or our heartbeat. This takes years and years of achievement. And again, it's not, no, I said the wrong word, it's not an achievement because after we fought for that, it's a gift. It's not an achievement. All those who've, whose witness we have in the Philokalia, they say, it will be given to you. You won't achieve it by yourself. Um, I don't want to see. I see we have a few minutes left. That's almost the last slide. Uh, degrees of honor prayer, I think I talked about this. But one degree I didn't talk about is that once we have achieved, once someone has achieved inner silence, totally absorbed into the awareness of the presence of God, then there is something else. It's only a beginning. We can call it contemplation, we can call it ecstasis, and so on. But those who have experienced it in the Philotalia, they are unanimous. It's not possible to talk or to write about it because those who will write, those who will listen to you or those who will read what you say about it, they cannot understand it. Only the experience of it can be, uh, uh, you can only experience it. You can say that you had the experience of it like these people in the Philotalia write about, but they say as far as, Describing it in a way that makes you having the experience, 
no way. It is a direct experience. In a sense, maybe uh, the Shaker or the Quaker tradition has something uh, to say about that. I didn't, I talked about the fact that it's a divine grace. And I would say ultimately that at all level, even the desire to start praying is a gift of God. But there is another aspect I didn't talk about, and that would require another presentation, is the enlightenment. The fact that it's possible that through the deepest level of prayers being achieved, this light that Saint Seraphim of Sarah was radiating is being perceived and seen by the one who prays. 14th century, Saint Gregory Palamas wrote a whole book about that in contradiction with uh, Western Mount Balaam, I believe was his name, saying that the people who achieved that on Mount Hathos, the monks who achieved that, they were not seeing a light, but they were being engulfed into the light of God. They were seeing it and they were being part of it, like Saint Seraphim. And just one last thing is that it's not emptiness, when we achieve this level of prayers, but then it is nourished by all the content of liturg liturgical life, Lectio Divina, and I have It's about love. Oops. But love, which is rediscovered before, before, beyond any definition. We don't know love until we pray for others. And then something will happen. And it's never limited. Each time, each moment is a new experience. A few quotes, and then I'll take questions if we have any, um, which are famous relate, uh, in relation with the philokaria. There are seven words of Jesus, seven sentences of Jesus, which are recorded outside of the gospel. And this is my favorite one. Wherever someone is absolutely alone, I am here. Jesus. Seraphim of Sarov. Acquire inner peace and thousands will find it through you. Also from Seraphim. The human spirit lies open to God alone for it is a fathomless depth. Then let's see if I can read the last one. It's covered by my screen. Whoever with, and that's from Siluan that I mentioned before, whoever will not love his enemies, or oh, I read this one before, cannot know the Lord and the sweetness of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit teaches us to love our enemies in such a way that we pity their souls as if they were our own children. And another one that I like from Silwan, whoever curses bad people and do not pray for them will never come to know the grace of God. And my very favorite one, you have a book, then read it. Reflect on what it says and apply the words to yourself. If you read without applying what is read to yourself, nothing good will come of it and even harm may result. Theories will accumulate in the head, accumulate, will accumulate in the head, sorry, leading you to criticize others instead of improving your own life. Tariton of Valamo, who wrote this, uh, nice anthology of the Philokalia. And uh, voila. Okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead and unshare. There we go, we're back. Thank you so very much. That was, um, that was a lot of information. And I'm, I think it's, um, it's not obvious, but it's easy to see the tie, the tie-in to as we study um, theosophy from various places. So thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs> so let's go ahead and open it up to questions, comments. Anyone? Jerry? 
Uh, unmute, unmute yourself. Yes. Yes, we. My, my, my little gizmo didn't get it done. Sorry about that. <laughs> um. The, the, the Dalai Lama is famous for saying that he's, his, his practice is Buddhism, but his religion is loving kindness. And, and you mentioned that beautiful phrase, uh, loving kindness in your presentation, which was so heartfelt and sincere. It was wonderful. What, for all of us that, think that that's a, a, an ideal worth striving for. Could you offer some thoughts as to how an individual can develop loving kindness? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, it starts with the desire. So have the desire for loving kindness. Uh, it's as simple as that, I would say. And then I would say when we have the desire, my experience is very simple, is that this desire is like opening your eyes on what is around you and who is around you. And with the desire to practice loving kindness, all of a sudden, basically, it's like you have a guide who tells you, who shows you in a very free manner, doesn't impose you anything. You're not acting out of guilt, you know, anything like that of need for social justice, which is very noble in itself, but you just act, you just see basically the world and people around you differently. You see their needs, you see their vulnerability possibly, you see their limitations and you begin to respect that and see how you can be a little bit like the piece of a puzzle in their life to make their life fuller. It can be as concrete as, you know, a, a very tangible form of help or as discreet, as little as a smile or speaking to people who maybe will have nobody to speak to in an entire day. It all depends. It might become a huge commitment people who get into humanitarian works, into charity works, and so on. But again, start with, with the desire for it. I have a question. Go ahead, Doug. Thank you. First, thank you for the talk. I enjoyed that. Sure, thank you. You're welcome. Um, during the talk, you showed the connection between the Jesus prayer and uh, it helping you to achieve exterior silence and interior silence. Yes. But you didn't say much about uh, could the Jesus prayer be involved in going to the final step of union or contemplation. So I, I guess that's my question. Is it limited to exterior and interior silence or can it also assist with um, uh, achieving union with God? Uh, it's the Jesus prayer never stops at any level of prayer, of, of practicing prayer. Uh, so I'm, uh, if I understand correctly your question, um, it's n maybe I gave the impression that would be wrong that, you know, inner silence is some kind of uh, ultimate goal or achievement. The goal is constant prayer. Lord Jesus, Son of the living God, have mercy of me, a sinner. And then once this is achieved, you know, it's some form of, and there we are, we are in between, we are in, oh, thank you, we are in between um, psychology and spirituality, uh, is that you can say the word with your mind, imprint them in your heart through a breathing technique, still say them and somehow, and I know it's a paradox, but spiritual life has a paradoxical dimension. And even with the words being in silence, I know if it answers your questions, your question. 
Okay. No, no, that makes sense. You're just going, you're just going to continue until it happens because you're just constantly praying and that's lead you home. Yes, it's, it's become, it's become a habit. It's become very like a physical, mental habit, automatism. You know, the reason why it's connected with breath, why it's connected with breathing is that we don't even pay attention to the fact that we breathe, that we do breathe. Uh, and it's, it's comparable. It's not the same thing we say in the words of the prayer, but it's comparable to that. You see, it becomes some kind of uh, um, inner motion, and it's a motion, but it doesn't prevent to achieve stillness at the same time. Okay. And, and again, I'm sorry, it, it, it is... It is not logical, but that's how I, I see it working. No, no, that, that's fine. Thank you. Pablo? No, yeah, I think it's what, what you said at the end. I was going to ask you, if I remember correctly, I read the diary of the Russian pilgrim many years ago, but mm. what he was saying is that at some point, the prayer is, uh, happens by itself. Uh, it's not that you are using your will to say the prayer, but the prayer is being said for you in a sense. Is that mm -hmm. what you were referring to? I, am I right in what I remember? Yes, 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 yes. In fact, and that completes uh, the previous question, um, is that there is a moment which we cannot achieve again by ourselves, but where prayer becomes like something becomes not light, but really something given to us. Uh, I don't know how to, okay, I'm gonna give you a very bad comparison, <laughs> but it's like when you drink a glass of wine. <laughs> once you've drink, once you've drunk on it, you know, you have the sense of ebriety without being drunk. You have this certain, you know, elation. And this elation continues after you stop drinking. And I would say, it's kind of comparable to the gift, to prayer as a gift, as opposed to prayer as a work, as a label. You know, it goes by itself. But again, it's, uh, we've done our part, but God has to do his part at his moment. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim, do you have something to add? Yeah, I, I wanted to thank uh, Jude for pointing out why we use wine in the sacraments. <laughs> well, I couldn't hear the last one. Why we use wine in the sacraments of the church. Jim is a, a priest with the liberal Catholic church here in town. Um, oh, hi, Jim. <laughs> how do you do, Jude? Uh, is it brother Jude? I, well, we do by father Jude. Your father, okay. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. father, uh, I wanted to point out another translation of Kyrie eleison, mm -hmm. uh, which is... Lord, give thyself to us. And the reason that's suggested is because eleison shares the same root with elemosinary, which is charitable giving. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, rather than Lord have mercy on us, it's Lord, give thyself to us. Well, thank you because it fits really well with the word of the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus, Son of the Living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Kyrie, uh, so eleison. And in fact, this, I didn't mention that, but there is a Trinitarian aspect to the construction of the prayer. But it ends up from God to men. And the Kyrie, the, the eleison part, means what you just said, come to us. It's, uh, the, there is a technical word for that. Uh, which is epiclesis. Epiclesis is another Greek word, which means an invocation of the Holy Spirit to come upon us and upon the wine and the bread. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, I, to, to complete yeah, this, another thing that uh, LA son, I mean, the word LA uh, also um, has the same root as oil. Oh, okay. And uh, um, so it means that basically uh, we receive the grace of God, let's oil put on our face too. Anointing, yes, okay. Anointing. Thank you. Okay. okay.
Okay. Um, while you guys are thinking, I want to, um, Father Jude, I want you to thank your son and your daughter-in-law for the use of uh, their place for us to have you here tonight. And uh, Mother Victoria, I want to uh, thank you for recommending Father Jude uh, for us this evening. And then um, if nobody has anything, I wanna plug the, um, the monastery's gift shop that they have. If you go online to St. Barbara in, I just think I put St. Barbara Monastery and it comes up and they have a wonderful um, gift shop that they have some lavender and those, did you call it a chachi, the Chachi. Prayer? chachi. Chachi, the prayer, the prayer knots, um, handmade there. And this might be odd, but I saw it today. They also have some um, craftsmen that make beautiful caskets out of wood, um, affordable caskets out of wood. That, and they're just absolutely gorgeous. I know that's like an odd thing to bring up, but um, as part of their uh, work, that is one of the things that they have built. So, yes. So I definitely want to, yeah, yeah, have you check out their website. And uh, as soon as you open up, uh, I will be one of the first ones there to visit. So I'm looking forward to that. Wonderful. So, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to interject something about the, cas the, the caskets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is that there is a saying in the Philokalia that, uh, if you remember your death every day, you are close to God. <laughs> All right. All right. Any other comments? Okay. Then we will go ahead and close for the evening. Um, uh, peace be with you. I know is a, a common. Is there another saying or uh, that you would a salutation that you would give to another that's better than that one? I can give you a liturgical one that I love very much. The grace of Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Okay. And that is a nice ending. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night, and thank you, Michelle. Thanks, yeah. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. That was great. Thanks, Susan.